I learned the whole continuum when I was working for Dane County Parks as a volunteer. They taught me how to chainsaw, and they put on chainsaw safety classes, and they teach you how to fell a tree the right way. And I learned about treating invasives, and they have herbicide and pesticide classes. Um, and I learned how to harvest seeds, how to plant prairies. Uh, led lots of school kids. Um, my mentor at the time was Wayne Pauley, and he's the one that uh, I worked for and learned from. And most people, when they're volunteering, like let's say that you want to do something good for society and you want to go volunteer at a food pantry, um, they don't really care how the food pantry operates. They just want to show up and do something good. Here, I'm working my three hours. Tell me what to do. I'll do it and check the boxes and give out the food. Well, with me, I want to learn this stuff. I mean, I want to know why some seeds, why they harvest at that point. And I got really fascinated with machining seeds. How do you clean them? How does, how does this equipment work and whatever? And I got to where um, I had some projects of my own and I asked permission to stay in the parks um, after people were done harvesting and then could I have permission to harvest seeds for some projects. Well, that grew. <laughs> People who know me know anything worth doing, doing is worth overdoing. Uh, that, that got me into harvesting seed for other projects and nonprofits. And to make a long story short, um, as Josh was saying, but I've been doing this about 13 years now. And I've, I've supplied seed to 100 plantings and 75 organizations. And um, when I'm done with my presentation and I take questions and answers, um, I have pictures of people receiving their seeds. And that's the fun part. Um, so let's see, with that, um, so tonight's agenda, now that I've, I've given you a little background, well, let me just tell you about that process so really quick. So how do people know to come to me for seed? It's kind of hard, I'm not a seed company, I don't have a website, it's word of mouth. And um, what I do is I operate like a foundation. So when people would like seed for their project, I have them submit something um, through email to me to tell me about their nonprofit and um, you know what they would do if I didn't supply the seeds and what kind of soil and sun requirements there are, things like that. So I get an idea and then I sort of line up the year with, with the places that are going to receive seed. So anyway, tonight I'd like to tell you a little bit then about how to uh, harvest seed and how to process it, some of the equipment that you use, and then we have the answers to the quiz and all the fabulous prizes I brought in. And then I'll take some of your specific questions. And this topic really lends itself to specific questions. It's kind of hard. I've, when I was putting this presentation together, I was realizing how much generalizing I was doing. And it's just hard to make a blanket statement about anything with seeds and when they're ripe and how you should go about cleaning them. They're all different. So I think I have to leave enough time for question and answer because that might be the most beneficial for you. Okay, here's a quote that I like. Even if I knew that the, um, tomorrow the world would go to pieces, I would still plant um, my apple tree. I'd plant my prairie. If I knew that. <laughs> the world was going to end. That's <clears throat> okay, so I'm going to talk about seed harvesting, where you can harvest seed, and how you get permission, and some tools and tips. And um, that's one of my favorite um, little pieces of uh, my gift that I got from some little squirrel that says I'll work for seed. <laughs> Okay, so where can you harvest seed? Um, on friends and neighbors' prairies, um, roadside and rail corridors. Rail corridors in particular, right, Cherry Gold? Rail corridors are the best. You can find all kinds of species there. Um, DNR sites, land trusts, uh, city and county prairies, U.S. Fish and Wildlife, and state parks. Um, the trick with those is um, navigating how you get permission to harvest in those areas. You just can't, well, with all these places, you just can't walk on and harvest, and they have, they all have different processes that you have to navigate. And then private property or conservancies. So some examples of unusual places that I've harvested seed. Um, the other thing is you can't be shy. You have to knock on doors and don't be afraid to ask. Um, I was driving by the Cross Plains Library, and I noticed they had a huge hedge of wild prairie petunia. And I went back on up who was in charge. And I met the ladies that maintained the garden. And I helped them with some education and gave them seed. And I would go and harvest those wild petunia and some other species that they had. 
um, restaurant parking lots. I used to go to the Prairie Cafe Diner in Middleton, and in their parking lot, right in the middle, they had this green space that they had thrown some native seeds in, and they had wild senna. And there were pretty big bushes of it, and I could show up, and I got permission from the, from the restaurant owner, um, and I would go in and harvest huge amounts of senna from these quick big mammoth bushes that they had. Um, these places are just so odd, odds and ends, they, they kind of crack me up that I'm not afraid to ask. Um, median strips. A lot of times in the map scenario, you find a group is maintaining a median strip and they'll have different uh, seeds being planted. And it really doesn't matter that it drops seed there to keep it going. I mean, those, whatever they plant there is going to take. So I've gotten permission on certain median strips. And um, the one that was one of the ones that happened lately was um, the grounds at a big tech company in Madison. Let's see, I'll tell the story really quick. A friend of mine was doing restoration in Middleton. And um, there's an old white church. It's on um, Pleasant View Road in Old Sock. And there's a cemetery there, an old cemetery. But if you go down the street, there's a hidden cemetery that has maybe 12 small grave sites. And this friend of mine was doing restoration there. They were clearing stuff. And, they, and when he was clearing the buckthorn and honeysuckle, he kind of punched a hole through the back of it. And here's this big corporate structure, this big building. And it was loaded with shooting star. The shooting star is $1,500 uh, $1, a pound. So anyway, um, he told me about it. He said, I think it's shooting star. You should go check it out. So I did the usual thing. I went to their lobby. I found out who was in charge. I set it up where um, you know, I explained what I was doing. And they gave me permission. And now for about four or five years, I've been harvesting shooting star at a, at a high-tech communication company of some sort. So um, anyway, enough of those stories. Did they do anything about that? Or that no, it was just luck that. Um, so, <laughs> It's, it's a little bit of a combination they had. Um, I really think it was just that they cleared the land on one side, and that was like a remnant prairie coming in. Although, unfortunately, because they're not maintaining it, it's getting overrun with sumac again on, on the other side. But um, I think they had some native plantings in beds, because I see native species, but nothing like the shooting star that I'm looking to harvest. And the person in the company that I met was someone that cared about natives. And so she, she was the person in charge. I thought I was going to talk to a building in ground sky. And it turned out it was a lady that was in charge of their native, native species. So, anyway. Okay. Um, so when you have these um, groups like U.S. Fish and Wildlife and DNR and state parks, um, there's not like a blanket one way to get permission. Um, like Governor Nelson State Park, um, I pretty much had to just go knock on doors there and find out who, who was in charge of maintaining their prairies. And the person that I ran into, the ranger, um, wanted to know where my seed was going to go. And because um, I couldn't tell them specifically, and I refused to, like because the seed is going to get divided up and go to 14 places, and I never know at the beginning of the year specifically where it's going to go. And ethically, I didn't like having to lie about it. Because I could have just said, holy oh, wisdom, they're going to get my seed this year. Right across the road, got a piece of cake. But because I didn't want to do that, she wouldn't let me hire the seed, which is fine. It's one of the only times I've been shot down. But anyway, later, a new person took over, and I asked the same question, and he, let, he lets me harvest there. So they have uh, flowering spurge that grows all along the property, and they have tons of it. So it's a nice place to harvest. So sometimes you have to keep asking. What I want to say about U.S. Fish and Wildlife is the fact that um, they, um, they have prairies, and I'm not trying to um, disparage their prairies, but they're of limited species plantings. They're planted for habitat, and they're also planted because they don't have tons of money to put in 150 species. So they'll plant areas that have like 30 species, and they'll be flush with something. So up towards Point Net, there's a couple that I have in mind. Um, one is all lupine, and one is all spiderwort. And if you can go somewhere that has tons of seed of a species, you really make good use of your time. But the trick is finding the right person to ask to get permission. So um, I, one of the first big plantings that I gave seed to was in Cross Plains. It's called Hickory Hill. 
It's 23 acres, and that was led by a guy from U.S. Fish and Wildlife. So you use that contact, and then you find out who else at U.S. Fish and Wildlife would be responsible. And you have to go down the chain until you find the right person to ask. And two different pieces of land, and they'll have different requirements. And the state, on their properties, um, it's been my experience, they want it in writing a year in advance. They want to know what species, and you sort of submit it, and it's got to go through the approval process. And I wish I could help you more, but you just have to navigate those. You find the areas that you want to harvest, and you have to figure out how to get permission to harvest. So it might be a little different because I'm out for nonprofits than if you're asking for your own private property. But if you tell them, hey, look, all these groups, everybody wants habitat. So if you sell it on the side that you're adding habitat, you, I think you're in good standing to get permission. Okay, so um, if it's a business, if you can support the business, that really helps. I hate going in and taking, give me this, give me that, I like this, can I have that? And what I'd rather do is have it the other way, and actually on my next, my next bullet point is, if it's a park or conservancy, help, volunteer, go out and help them collect seeds, help them do some chainsaw work, whatever, and then say, by the way, would you mind if I harvest some seed? But if you just show up and you're a stranger, you, know, you might not have as much luck. So helping people, if be it a private landowner or a park or whatever, it just helps to, to give them a hand. And the last thing is to offer to split your harvest. Um, the time, actually, Jerry, I'm going to point to you again. The time I remember was with the prairie enthusiasts. And they had a flush of a certain species, and they said I could harvest as long as I could hold out all day and harvest seed, as long as I gave 30% to Jerry's Conservancy, 30% to the prairie enthusiasts, and 30% for myself. So, um, you know, if you can make an arrangement like that where you're supplying the labor, they're getting seed out of it, that's their site. That works out pretty well, and it's in everybody's best interest. Okay, harvesting tools. Seed collecting bags. There was a lady, oh gosh, 15 years ago, her name was Rumi, and she came up with seed harvest bags. And they've been through a million iterations. They really have, every time they're made, they're different. The last iteration of these was with um, bird, 50 pound bird seed bags. And the ladies that sold these liked the bags, and they were trying to buy the seed. And what they decided to do was go right to the, hoard, to the source that some company in Montana made the bird seed, and they wrote to the guy and said, can we get some of your empty bags? And he didn't respond. So they wrote them again, and they wrote them again, and they wrote them again, and all of a sudden, like 500 bags showed up. <laughs> so it pays to be persistent. But what these are, so the strap, the fit over your shoulder, you open up it, you harvest your seed, and you throw it in the bag. It's pretty simple. What I like about it is it has an adjustable strap, so you can change the height um, of it. And if, especially if you have you know, high school kids or whatever, they're versatile. Um, I've got these that made them bigger or wider, because when I go out, I'm in a park, and I don't want to have to empty bags and come back and forth. And what I also like about these is that you can swing four of them at a time. It's really easy to have two on each side, you can do four species. You can just stay at it. Because if you, if you, it's just inevitable, you get out in the field and you're thinking you're harvesting one thing, you go, oh God, look at that, there's pants and double thighs over there. You know, and then you don't have the collection bag, so you have to haul all the way back, get to your car, you know, get to your stuff, and go back. So it's, that's the nice thing about um, these collection bags. Um, the next thing are five gallon peels. There. And so I'm going to name some species that I think five-gallon pails are good for. Um, white and purple curry clover, wood betony, lupine, rose hips, horse gentian, two-fourth bloodwort, Dutchman's bridges, and that list. Other than bergamot. Okay, why did I list those? Does anybody have any idea what those plants have in common and why I would use a pail? They're short. Yeah, you can set the bucket on the ground, and then it, it's a lot more efficient just to work on the ground and not bend over with that big seed collection bag. So on anything short like that, uh, five gallon pails are great. Um, bergamot, that's, I'll, I'll talk about that a little bit later, and why bergamot in five gallon pails. 
And then paper bags are really good for lightweight stuff. If you're doing pass flowers, very small. If you have kids harvesting grade school kids, give them paper bags. That works out really well. Pruners and gloves. Um, everybody has a preference in pruners. And I, I don't have a lot to say about it. I just know what I like. I like ones that have a hook on it so that when I'm reaching for stuff, I can hook the plant and bring it back towards me. But that's kind of a silly little thing. It doesn't matter. Um, and gloves for when you're harvesting prairie thistle, um, pale purple coneflower, rattlesnake master, um, marble seed. You get the little fibers in your fingers. It's good to wear gloves when you're harvesting those. Otherwise, I don't wear them. I like, I like the feel of the plant that I'm harvesting. I feel what the seed feels like. So I really need not to wear gloves most of the time. And then the most important equipment is always have a first aid kit in your car and always have a cell phone. Um, so uh, now I'm on blood thinners. It's even worse. I cut myself probably three times a year at least in a harvest season. And you just have to have stuff to stop the bleeding when you're, you're on the field. It's just a must. Um, I thank God for COVID because I was out in the valley a long way from anywhere and I had a COVID mask in my back pocket and I didn't have my first aid kit. And I cut myself and I was able to wrap the mask around me and just get somewhere better. But the cell phone, other than if you, like let's say you got injured or something, that's one thing, but um, I was at Jerry's property again. Jerry, you're the highlight of my presentation. <laughs> I'm glad you showed up to my Jerry has swamp lovers, conservancy. It's 450 acres, so it's a big place. And so, and he lets me harvest there, and I get him see coming back the other way. So, I had my car, I drove way up, um, up on the top of a bluff, and way back into the woods with my car, and the ignition went out. Oh. And <laughs> now, now you're just stuck. So, if you don't have a cell phone, I don't, I don't know, I would I'd probably still be out there right now. I mean, that was just miles from being anywhere. So it's just, those are two things that you have to have. Okay, harvesting tips. Um, when, you're, when you're harvesting, if you go out in the field, when the plant is setting seed, it's the wrong time to look for it. You have to look for the plants when they're blooming. It's just, if you're wandering around looking for these dried plants, it's just impossible. If you look at that picture, Butterfly milkweed, perfect example. <laughs> Bright orange neon, there it is. I got it. But if you come later, you just have the green pods that blends into everything else. So it's nice to identify your harvest patches. And then I use flagging tape a lot. You get this at Menards or anywhere, it's just plastic ribbon. You just tear it off. Tie a knot around, pick something tall, tie a knot around something so that you can find it again someday when it's, when it's setting its seed. And the other thing is to communicate with your network of friends uh, about when it's time to harvest. And Mary, <laughs> I use you a lot. I'll call Mary and say, hey, what are you seeing? Is the trout really ready to pick? Or should I drive 45 minutes to get there? Because the worst thing, especially when it's an individual, is when you're driving somewhere and you climb a mountain and you get up to the top and you go to harvest the poke milkweed and it's not ready. You climb down the hill and you go home and you come back a week later you climb the hill again and the same thing happens and finally hit it on the day it's right. And it's just a waste of time. So network with your friends. Any contacts you have, hope. Oh, it saves you, it just saves you so much time. Um, and then know what the mature seed looks like. Um, and know when the seed is ready to harvest. Um, when you take a seed in general and put it in your hand, you shouldn't be able to crush it with your thumb. If you do, it's not a valid viable seed in general. Um, and the other thing is to know what a, a seed looks like. Go to prairiemoon.com. They have pictures in detail, um, blown up pictures of what the seed looks like. And if you know what it looks like, it's a heck of a lot easier to know when you should harvest it or target it. Uh, another indicator is when the plant is freely dispersing its seed. It's kind of obvious, but um, the problem with that is species like prairie phlox, stuff that um, ejects its seed. You've got probably, if you were trying to get the seed at the right time on prairie phlox, you probably got 48 hours tops to get that seed before you miss it. 
And there's just this is a time to maybe tell you this. You're, most times you're never going to get all the seed from a plant. And the best example of that is spiderwort. Spiderwort will have a couple blooms each day for about a month, and the ones that bloom first are setting seed, and the rest of the plant is still kicking off these blooms. So you'll never get the 300 seeds that are in the plant, but you can try to average it out. And so that's something like when I harvested at Dane County Parks. Kind of surprised me, they were harvesting seeds that were really green, seed tops that had flowers on them. Now how can that be? Well, because the season for setting seeds on that plant is so long. And the other example I want to give is New Jersey tea, flower and spurge, lupine. They explode. If you're late to the dance, you're just late. Uh, lupine, if you've ever seen it, it corkscrews. And it can fire seed 25 feet. In fact, uh, Jenna, you were out, out helping me harvest it this year. It's kind of funny because it's like popcorn poppy when it's going off in the field. You, can kind of, you have to kind of dodge, dodge it once in a while, but New Jersey tea is the same way in flower and spurge. And so you have to get it a little early. Um, let's get it to the next. Um, some species will finish ripening in your drying tubs. Um, the best example I can give for this is not to talk about native seeds, but the invasive species. When you're out on the site and you're harvesting garlic mustard, um, Dame's Rocket, White Nail, Sweet Clover, the groups always remove the seed from the plants from the site because there's enough energy in the plant to finish. And so you try to get them up and out of there. And um, some seeds um, can finish if you can harvest them a little early and then the drying rack still finish ripening. Um, and then th this is just a, uh, another th repeat of uh, um, find large patches. Just for example, this hot patch, that's world milkweed. It's a 10 acre parcel, and it's nothing but world milkweed. And uh, it just makes it your time go really fast harvesting it. And the same with uh, the yellow is Golden Alexander at Ice Age Trail. There's just millions and millions and millions of Golden Alexander plants. The lupine is my lupine hill, the, the blue. So if you can find patches like that, it really cuts down on your harvest time. And don't uh, harvest plants growing in small patches. Just leave, just walk away. Um, best example would be in my own prairie. I've got uh, Indian paintbrush started. The last thing I want to do is go into the little colonies that are starting to form and harvest them. I'll wipe them out again. So things have to be established and long live, they're safe to harvest. The same thing goes true with short lived per perennials and annuals. So like this, uh, this is Venus looking glass and pale spike lobelia, ne just I never harvest those because they have to count on reseeding themselves and you can wipe out a colony by doing it. So if, you're, if I'm donating seed to cherry, that will not be one of the 191 species that I'm supplying because I don't want to hurt the site. And the same is that you should have a healthy respect for remnant prairies. It took a thousand years for them to reach an equilibrium or balance, and you don't want to go in and harvest and upset that balance. There's exceptions to everything I'm telling you tonight. You can go into a remnant prairie and there can be lots of lead plant. The lead plant is people live, I don't know, 75 years. It's a long life plant. If there's tons of it and you take some of it in a remnant, it's not that big a deal. But in, um, if you're going in and there's a small colony of downy painted cup, you can do great damage to a remnant. So it's a special situation to be really mindful of if you ever get permission to harvest in a remnant. Actually, I'll touch on one thing. Ice Age Trail just opened up a new area called Mammoth Back. And it's, uh, it was just a, it's a, <laughs> like a saddleback rise of land that brought, like a goat prairie that were, comes out of the land, just this big flat area, and here's this great big mountain. And, and it was all um, invasive species. And when they opened up the invasive species, it flushed with columbine. The columbine seed was in the soil. It finally got sunshine. It had been sitting there for however long, and it just flushed. There was columbine everywhere. And there was also um, a type of uh, a type of goldenrod, white goldenrod. It was just everywhere on the hill. 
those are times when you can go take a little up. You can harvest it and feel sort of safe because the seed bank is so prevalent. The other thing is that when you open up that much sunlight, those species are going to disappear anyway. Like columbine generally is a, is a shade loving species. And if you have it on a rocky top in full sun, it's just not going to thrive there. And if you came back in 20 years, you wouldn't find much of it, whether you harvested it or not. So, anyway. Uh, harvesting tips. Okay. Uh, when you can, try to strip your seed out in the field instead of having to take it and process it with the equipment I'm going to talk about. Um, like thimble wheat, good example. Just pull it off the top, it's all set, put it in a bag, and you can give it to somebody. Um, white and yellow, or white and purple prairie clover, um, showy and Illinois tip tree foil. You can strip those right in the field and they're good to go. You don't have to do anything more. So whenever you can, do that. When I was talking about five gallon pails, I was saying you can take bergamot for five gallon pails. And why is that? Because bergamot readily gives up its seed. And so you can just bunch together a clump of it, take your pail, bend the tops over, just bang them on the side, and all the seed comes pouring out and there's no chaff. Um, common evening primrose, just like it. Cut off the top, shake it, and you've got seed out. Fig wart works the same way. So there's bunches of seed where you can use a pail and just collect it clean in the field and you save yourself a lot of time. Okay, that brings us to how to dry your seeds. Most, everybody I know that does any kind of volume uses kiddie pools. So um, you buy a bunch of kiddie pools and um, the lesson I learned over and over again is and you put a rock a log or a cinder block in your kiddie pool because they're like flying saucers. It's like, you know, you walk out and go, oh my God, it's blowing up my hill. There they go. And, and I just seem to have to keep learning that lesson over and over again. Um, and then cover the pools with screens that you can make yourself. This is something that fits over the top of these five foot pools. And it's just a couple wood um, stringers and you just get a mesh and staple it to it. And what's really nice about it is when you're not using it, you can just roll it up. And it doesn't take up very much space. So these are easy to make. And you use it for fluff species like common milkweed, asters, bone sets, anything that can blow away. Oh, and your exploding species. Um, flowering spurge, New Jersey tea, the stuff that explodes, lupine, you have to have screens on top or they, they'll just fire all over the place and you lose them. So. And then uh, <laughs> use large fans to speed up the drying process. I don't do that outside much, but I do it in my garage. Once the end of the day comes, I have to haul this in my garage. And then I set up fans blowing over the top. And the whole reason why they dry seeds is the mold. If you were to harvest some seeds and put them in big bags, they, you'd have moldy, a moldy product. So you have to dry them before you process it. Okay, I probably should have hit this first, but why clean seeds? I mean, if you're just going to add a few species to your prairie, you don't really need to clean seeds. But here are the main reasons. If you're going to do a supply seed for a bigger planting, and they're going to use like a Truex or really a cedar machine, the seed's got to be fairly clean to go through. You also need to know um, what the the precise amount of seed for a planting rate. Um, if you're going to plant like four pounds of forb seed per acre, you need to have clean seed. If you're weighing the chaff, that doesn't count as seed. So that's another reason why you clean it the way I, I have to. Um, I'll go to the pale purple coneflower. If you were just to take those without processing them and throw them on the ground, there's probably 50, 60 seeds in each top and you're putting a concentration of seed every time you throw it on the ground. So if you don't pull the seed out from the chaff, you're just overplanting your area. And because they take up so much space, I mean, if you don't process them, they, they take up an ungodly amount of space if you're doing much of a harvest. So that brings me to the heavy equipment, two big pieces of heavy equipment. The first one is a hammer mill. And that's Chris um, yeah, from Ice Age Trail. And he's standing on a ladder, and there's a hopper. 
And what you're doing is you're taking your plant material and you're loading it into this, this device. It's cast iron. It has a round chamber and it looks like a clam. So that when you open it, it opens up like a clam. And it's got a pointer. See if I can do this. Right here, it's got different uh, screens with different size holes. They're semicircles. And so you slide in the screen that you want to the size that you want. And then these are metal plates. These are not blades. This is not chopping your seed. This is knocking your seed, and there's a big difference. All you're trying to do is you're trying to knock the seed loose from the plant. And what it's going to do is when you seal that chamber, and, the, and the, these plates are spinning around inside, it's going to knock them around until everything's small enough to fit out those holes in the bottom, and they'll fall down, down below. So like what Chris is putting it in, things spinning around here, product that fits through the holes is coming out into a bucket in the bottom. Okay, so why do I make a big deal about not grinding stuff up? Because anything you grind up, you're grinding up the chaff with the seed. And the more you grind up the chaff, the more it's the same size as the seed, and you're gonna have a hard time then going back and separating it. So compass plant is a good example. If you can put compass plant through here and use as big a screen as you can and just let the machine knock it, the seeds come loose, but you have these great big sticks, big pieces, they're really easy to screen out. But if you chop everything up, everything is the same size, and then you gotta do some of the next things we're gonna talk about. So anyway, hammer mill, really important to knock the seed loose in, in plants. Linnea, you're on, you're on the screen. So this is a fanning mill. It's a little trickier to explain. Try and do this and have it make sense. Um, there's a top screen. Top screen has bigger holes. And a, and a bottom screen that has smaller holes. And the screens are loaded in here. And the machines shake. So on your top screen, these ladies are putting in seed. And they're putting it here. And it's running down the top of that top screen. And as the seeds are going down, the, the hole is big enough for the good seed to fall through. And what comes off are the sticks. And it will go to a bucket over here. And then the bottom screen is so tiny that the seed can't fall through, but your dust does. So you can take a layer of your dust off of the seed, and that comes out in this bucket here. So you have this, your seed and some chaff that's the same size going down the middle of this machine, and it falls over the edge, and that's why it's called a fanning mill, because it has a blower. And you can set the blower at different speeds. And so what happens is, when the seed falls over the edge and you hit the blower on it, it blows the chaff off and the seed is so heavy, it goes, it falls down. So way down here, there's a container and the good seed falls into there. The stuff in the blower blows up into here and the sticks go that way and the dust goes that way. And that's the first machine. I had an old retired farmer teach me how to run this. I just got hooked, I just thought it was the coolest thing. It, it reminded me of, what do they call those, Rube Goldberg machines, <laughs> mazes or whatever. It's such a weird contraption. This equipment's 100 years old, and the farmers used to have hand cranks to clean their seed. And, and so then what happened is people knew that they still wanted to use these, but they motorized them, so they hang some motor on <clears throat> The trick is that there's a lot of people that have these, and if you're interested in them, you can get them. But, uh, the important thing is the screens. You have to have complete sets of screens and they're really expensive. And if you don't have those, the device is useless. So anyway, that's a thing. Okay, so if you don't have a hammer mill, now what are you going to do? Well, I didn't know how to answer that. You're kind of stuck if you don't have a hammer mill. You can hand strip some species and you can hand clean some species, but you can't smash them. And when I went online, I found some tutorials that just cracked me up. There's one person that's advocating a screwdriver and someone else using a Swiss Army knife. So I harvest pounds and pounds and pounds of pale purple coneflower, and I had the thought of sitting with a screwdriver whacking at it. It's just not going to work. 
Now, a hammer mills cost about 4,000 bucks. And one thing is they'll run for a million years, and when you're done with it, you can always, almost find, almost always find a home for it. So I donated mine to Groundswell, and then all of a sudden I found myself needing one again, and I got one back from U.S. Fish and Wildlife. So they're sort of out there. And if you're a private landowner, and you want to be able to use a hammer mill without buying it, I would bet that you could get time on a hammer mill. If you did something in return, volunteered, did something to help someone that has a hammer mill, they'd let you use it for a day, bring in all your seed and, and chop it up. Because it's pretty important. If you don't have a fanning mill, you can get by that. So how do you get by that? I'm just going to pass these around. If you would just sort of pass them so people can kind of look at these. These are the hand screens I use. And the thing that cracks me up about these is these are made for gold dust. You're a gold miner, and that's what you use. And I have, oh gosh, I have, they come in sets of like 12 sizes. And there's really tiny screens as well as really big ones. And then these are made for bonsai plants. So bonsai plants, uh, people who have bonsai trees have to screen soil for some reason. And they need a screen like this. So if you're using these, what you want to do is emulate a fanning mill. You want to do a pass using a big screen so that the seed drops through and you get rid of the sticks. And then you do it again and you get rid of the dust. And now you're left with just some, some chaff in your seed about the same size. Um, and <laughs> so then what do you do? You've got seed and chaff still. This is hard to explain. I'm just going just gonna to touch on it. You have to use the wind. And you have to be able to like blow on or use the wind outside or use a fan. Or, I like to use this. Anyone know what this is, by the way? Um, so, like, when I have a, my keyboard at home, I used to buy cans of compressed air to clean up my keyboard. This is a compressor, hand, hand compressor, that you can recharge. Right there, you, you can clean your seeds. So, if you put your seeds, let's say they're on a trailer, and you don't have big edges for the chaff to go over, it's pretty easy to figure out how to blow the chaff and the seed has weight and it won't blow away. You can do that putting on. I, I just hit this briefly. And the way that, if you have volumes, um, the way that a lot of people do it is they'll set up a fan and they'll set up tarps or kiddie pools or some big receptacles. And they'll take their seed and they'll pour the seed in front of the fan and the fan will blow it out in a distribution pattern. And the closer to the fan will be the seeds because they have the weight and the farther out you go, the more you have chaff. And they'll sort of draw a line where the seed ends and the chaff starts on the tarp. And then they'll roll, separate it and roll it up. That's how they get their clean seed. Um, you can also build a box like this. Um, it's a screening table or a screening box. This works good if, you, if you're like Dane County Parks. You have a bunch of volunteers. You can have them all bending over a table with asters or whatever you're doing, rubbing it against the screen, and the seed will fall up through the bottom. I'll show you a video of my way of doing that. It's uh, similar. It's right here. Um, so first, what I do when I'm cleaning the seed with, without a, um, and I don't want to grind it up when it's fluff species, is um, I just rub them against each other. You just kind of work them a little bit. Don't have to get all the seed. In a short time, you can get the bulk of the seed out. So after you rub it together, this is what the, the, your uh, seed looks like. Now you can plant that. Um, when, I'll show you the next thing. Next video is screening. So <laughs> so these screens. And you can screen it to get it cleaner, but you're taking off this layer of sticks. And the product doesn't have to be perfect. Even when I'm supplying big plantings, it just has to be better. You can't have big sticks everywhere, especially if you have volunteers planting by hand. You're going to reach their hand in a bag of seed, and their sticks are everywhere. So it'd be some mess to plant with. So you do want to take some level of cleaning when you're doing this stuff. This is, that's how I do it. And then there's a whole bunch of seed I clean manually. Um, they tend to be 
berries or like bellwort inside a capsule. And what's good is I like watching Brewers Packers games. I watch uh, movies and stuff on TV, so I'll sit all night and hand clean seed. It's, uh, it's great therapy. Um, it's like blue cohosh gold, a golden seal. This is actually very cool. This is the, um, the seed pot at the top of golden seal. It's a woodland plant. And this is what it looks like when you clean it. It's take it by hand, take all of them off. And they, they just have a gloss black sheen that just looks like a black trans it just, just It just shines. Such, such a beautiful seed. And Janet, thanks for this picture. Also use your chaff. So when you have chaff, you want to separate it by, um, if it's for wetlands, um, mesic soil or dry, and if it's sun, hard shade or shade. You don't have to save all your chaff, but there's, like for example, when I was cleaning those asters, there's lots of seed left when I'm going through that cleaning process. I'll throw it in a big bag, and I'll still put that seed on the ground. I won't use it to give to somebody, but I'll use it maybe in my own prairie. I'll make sure it hits the ground somewhere. People will take chaff if you can sort it out by the different types of ground that you're going to hit. Oh, and the last thing, we're to my last slide, is storage. And I don't have a lot to say. Um, you have to pick stuff that you can stack up. It makes a mess in your house. She will puts up with it every year. Um, you try to not put it in a hot room or in the sunshine. And as soon as the season's over, I try to, I have to weigh, bag, label everything to get rid of the plantings. You try to get through that as soon as possible because, see, it just takes up so much space. But there's not a right or wrong. I guess if you have small quantities, you should try to use paper bags. To, they breathe better. It's better for the seed, better for the environment, not using plastic. But when you have seed that there's 100,000 seeds to the ounce, it can get in the cracks of those bags. And if you ever have a bag tear and the seed goes out on you, that's why I use plastic bags. Okay, so before I start giving out the answers to the quiz and you win all my fabulous prizes, I want to reinforce one thing. Volunteer. If you can go out and volunteer, that's the best way to learn this stuff. And it'll help with your own property. And if you can volunteer with multiple groups, you can work with different naturalists. I'm sure Josh, as a naturalist here, will have a different way of doing it than Wayne did, or Lars with Dane County Parks, or Rich Henderson, or whatever. Um, the more people you work with, the more you learn different methods. And they all work. That's the other thing, is there's not the right answer. It's the right answer is the right answer for your property or your seed collection. Okay, so get out your, get out your quizzes. So, everybody's ready. The first one is butterfly weed, and the answer is D. There's 4,300 seeds to the ounce. Compass plant is A, 660 um, seeds to the ounce. Culver's root, 800,000 seeds to the ounce, L. Great Blue Velia, 500,000 to the ounce. Great St. John's Park, 225 to the ounce. Lead plant. Okay. They are up here. So, okay. so, it's, so far it's D A L K J G. Sorry about that. I didn't think the Russian. Mount Mint I is 200,000. Pale purple coneflower. And I'll leave these up at the end for you to look at again. Okay before I have the great reveal on the uh, tiebreaker. <laughs> so pale purple coneflower is E, 5200. Rattlesnake master is F, 7500. Sky blue aster, 70,000 H. White black indigo, 1700. And finally lupine, 1100. How are we doing so far? <laughs> okay. So it's, once again, from the top, it's D A L K J G I E F H C P. And, oh, not ready yet? No, no. Should I go back? Yes, please. Okay. Ron, did everybody see this jar for the tiebreaker? 
Did everybody get to see the tiebreaker jar? Oh, make sure. Did you get to see it? Okay. Okay, ready for the uh, tiebreaker? Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. By the way, that jar is also a prize. Um, there's five different types of seed. There's, um, there's Northern Bed Straw, Wood Bethany, New Jersey Tea. I tried to get stuff that's interesting. Spike and Art, Curry, um, Blazing Stock, and that jar of uh, monkey flower, which goes in wetlands, wet species. Pretty little flower, too purple. Okay, so the answer to the tiebreaker is... But it is kind of a handy thing to see when you're planting. It's just, it's, it's kind of fun. And, uh, that monkey flower, once again, came from Jerry. And I, in my slide presentation of seeds before, there was a bowl of them, and there were 15.5 ounces, and that's something like 35 million or whatever of these seeds. Now, that, that being said, it's a good example. Those seeds are not all valid. Um, when you have species like cream, gentian, things like that, those seeds are not valid. Color seed. You, you know, you want to you want to harvest at the right time, and you want to get as high of um, your viable seeds as you can by when you harvest it. But the plants themselves, it's not putting out three, three million plants when you scatter that. So, <laughs> yep. When when you buy. Seeds from, say, Prairie Moon. Um, can you expect that, by and large, they harvested them at the right time and they're mostly viable? Yeah, they have a standard. I know this is mostly their grasses, but they send them out to a lab. They test them, and it's called PLS. When you see that, it's pure live seed. And um, I've bought from Prairie Moon for a long time. I've never had a problem or issue. Actually. Neil the ball at Prairie Nursery never had a problem with their seeds being viable. It's it's making sure that I do the right thing on my end. Actually, when I see groups that I give seed to and, and the prairies fail, most of the time it's the prep and how they plant it. Not prepping the soil to pick them. One thing one thing about the um, prairie moon or any of the other agricultures one, if their seed isn't very good, they test everything they sell. So say it's 50% viable. So if you've ordered two ounces, they'll, your bag will have four ounces in it. So, so you get what you pay for. And they, they've tested it. So they'll, they'll you know, give you the equivalent of pure live seeds. And so you might get a great big bag full. It won't be much. <laughs> It's just the same thing. The other way I've seen it is that they have the termination rate. So you know, what the, you know what the termination rate is, you can multiply that time in the count and you know what you're doing. Um, so at this point, I do want to tell you thank you for having me and for your interest and for your attention during my long winded stories. And um, I'd be glad to take questions, although I'm going to have Josh put on a slideshow while I'm doing that so that people have something to look at. So if you want to pop that up. Yes. and how they process seed. He asked if it's the same now as it was a few years back. And, and they have gone through this renaissance. They have grown like crazy. And um, I used to, part, I partnered with them with Wayne 
And then with the new natural slurs, he really grew the program. So anyway, on the last year, it was two years ago that I partnered with him, and what we did is I would harvest, and all their people would harvest, and we'd throw it all in one big pile, we'd clean it all together, and then they'd divide up and they'd give me a percent. Um, but the last year I did that, they did a million six hundred thousand dollars with the seed, seventeen hundred pounds pure, two hundred and twenty species, something like that, and they only grew. And when I used to work with Wayne, they had um, maybe three or four fanning mills, and they had my uh, hammer mill and Sherry's hammer mill, and now they have, oh my goodness, they have, they have four or five uh, hammer mills, and maybe, God, they, they have, the new fanning mills look like Zamboni machines. If you've ever seen those big machines that clean the ice, there are these huge boxes, metal, and they're, they're a lot more expensive. Um, once I looked into them, I don't remember what the price was, but it's prohibitive the weight. I couldn't have that delivered to my driveway and somehow get it in and out of my garage. They're huge, whereas these old fanning mills, um, those, are, those are great for home use, or for your garage or your barn or wherever you're processing seed. So Dane County looks a lot different. It's the same thing they're doing, but the scale is just night and day different. Now they have a they have a cool room, so they have a temperature control room to put stuff in. And they've really come a long way. Yeah, we volunteered this year over in their facility up of, uh, near Lake Farm. Yep. And uh, it's a really great way to learn how to work with seeds and their equipment. When in the old days when I worked with them, they were in with the so all of Dean County, they have the um, vehicles, they have the plows and anything to maintain Dean County anything. So all the mechanics were right there. So they have a little space for us to process seeds. And all the mechanics heated our guts whenever it was time to process seeds because there's uh, this particulate in the air. Oh, that's one thing I'm remiss in not, in not telling you. When you're using a hammer mill, um, for a lot of species, you really should be using a mask. Um, there's a real fine particulate, and you can be breathing it in. In the picture, Chris with, that was using the hammer mill was outside, and if there's a nice breeze, you can kind of get by with it. But some species, even then, you should be wearing a mask. Um, the other thing I was going to tell you is, when I process milkweeds, I love being outside, and I look for a day with the wind, because the wind will blow all that fluff when you're putting it through the hammer mill, and the seed's heavy enough to drop out. Seed is coming up out of the top and on the sides and everything, but it's blowing off. It's all the chaff you want to get rid of. And in fact, the way that I clean that is I have kind of a horse bucket, and I take what's left of the fluff in the, in the milkweed seeds, and I go and shake them at an angle to the wind, or I just get a fan. And you can the seed goes so much to the bottom that you can just take that whole top layer off. It cleans. I know so many people that don't like cleaning milkweed, and they do it by hand, and, press it down with their thumb and do one pot at a time. It really is pretty easy to, to um, clean it in large batches because the seed weighs so much more than the fluff. But you do need to separate the seed with a hammer mill or something like that. So. Questions? Do you know if anybody's making the small hammer mills? Like, yeah. Because um, it's so there's a tabletop model they have. And I went and looked online and you can, you can buy those. They have little screens and they're good for small sizes. Um, I just saw it used to hand screening that I can feed, I can get through quantities faster than that, but it, it does work and it's kind of nice for, you know, because it has a blower on it. There's another device, oh gosh, on the sheet that I gave you for resources, there's a set of YouTube videos. It's a seed company somewhere in the Midwest and the guy comes on, he has pretty good tutorials. They're just not real practical. I forget the name of the device, but it's like a $15,000 device that's a, it's basically doing the same thing. It's using air to clean the seed. But first you have to, um, you have to screen the seed twice to get it really close to what you want. Then you feed it into this tiny little thing that looks like the weirdest contraption. And what comes out is like the drawer on an old coffee grinder. I mean, it, it processes about this much seed loading through it. But for the amount of money, it's not practical for quantities or small, small operations. So there are, there are other equipment, it's just that's why I gave you those links. You can kind of go look at what people do. 
And there's lots of boards, like on Facebook, where people share information and they, they tell you how they clean seed. I'm kind of set in my ways now because I've done it long enough, but I do pay, try to pay attention if there's a better idea, if there's you know, something that's, that's doable. Obviously, the seed matures probably toward the fall. But when would you start, okay, when, when would you advise if you're going to pick some seed with parts of when would you think you start May. and when would you end? May. May? Yeah, well, the first seed would be past flower smoke, gray smoke, uh, tr Dutchman's Bridges, um, Trump Lily, that whole, all the spring ephemerals, they're ready fast. Um, it's the, it really is a continuum. It's when the flower blooms and it's going to set seed. So the first big harvest, really big quantities are wood bentony and lupine. And that would be more like, uh, God, that would probably be end of May, beginning of June, but some, sometimes the stuff all blends together. I forget when they're popping and ready. Depends on the weather that year, too. But no, you really start as a, once you're going, it's following the bloom pattern, and you're off to the races because you'll miss it. Um, you don't have a large window to collect seeds. They're ready to disperse. And especially like uh, Dutchman's Bridges, uh, you get kind of one shot at that for maybe four or five days. And then because the temps are warming up and it's a spring plant, it starts to wither and you just won't find it anymore. It just disappears fast. And same with, same with all that stuff, toothwort, toothwort, yeah. spring beauty, all of those. Like the, gold, the stuff later in the year, you have all kinds of time. Uh, showy goldenrod uh, and rigid goldenrod and some of the leatrices and stuff. You have tons of time, the bone sets and ironweed and stuff like that. You really, you, you have a month to get those. But a lot of seeds, when they're ready to disperse, they go and off and you know, they go. So. Yeah. so when you show the slide of your pools sitting yeah. outside, are you turning those during the day? Like, Not too how, much. Oh, okay. how long is that process where you're taking you know, Yeah, I don't turn them during the day, but what I'll do is when I haul them out and they're there, when I'm pulling them in, I'll, I'll rotate them. And usually what I have is one extra pool. And all I do is just flop one pool into the next and put that in. But boy, that's the biggest, that's the big, one of the biggest chunks of work is hauling those things in and out every day. And you just can't leave them out. If you get dew or rain or anything that you don't count on, it sets you back. And that's just your pre-hammer mill yeah. drying? Yeah, okay. Yeah. You know, Although, just real quick, when you have those dry tubs like spider wart and you have it in there and it dries, seed falls out, so if you don't want to get into the cleaning process, then just take the top layer off and you're going to be left with a whole bunch of seed on the bottom. Same with lupine or the exploders. You can get by harvesting more plants um, to uh, come up with less seed, but you still have pure seed. You don't have to go through what I'm doing to clean and harvest so much. You're hauling them back because you want them to see the sun. What's that? You want them to get them out in the sun. Well, if they can, but they just need wind. They just don't need to oh, the wind. You know, the yeah, it's just getting them out in the open air. If you have when you're driving, it's not getting air movement. So. Um, have you ever tried a shop bag for the milkweed kind of thing? No. But um, that, I wish I could think of the name of that. One machine uses like a shop bag as the vacuum yeah. process. And also, and, I wanted to ask you about. A lot of these things, the seeds have to be cold, right? So, after you pick them? Yeah. No, um, not for me to get them out. They have to go through cold stratification when you're putting them out in the field. So, okay. if you have these seeds, and I have them warm in my house at 60 degrees, okay. and I get them out to someone to plant, and now they're passing in November, they have to go through either 30 or 60 days, and sometimes two years mm -hmm. of cold stratification. That's where they have to be. And, and that breaks dormancy. Okay. If that's what I'm seeing, it has to be cold, focused. Yeah. But real quick, Prairie Moon is fantastic. They tell you germination codes, okay. and they'll tell you how long. And that double whammy that I, I just found that out like two years ago that like sow and seal and a lot of those woodland species, they have to go through two years just to break dormancy. Okay. A Dutchman's Bridges, Blood Root, almost all of those take two years. Okay. So at first I just thought they weren't showing up. 
And it's like, no, it takes two years if you're lucky, maybe a third. Then they're like a little client, a little bigger. And seven years down the road, you go, oh, blood root. I planted that. But, um, sir, you got it. So, um, how do, what's the best way then to preserve it? So I planted my 30 acres, but I got that much left in a bucket. Um, I just put it in the basement in a container. Like right now, because it's winter, just I have. Just dry, somewhere dry. Um, well, I have mine up in a plastic container. I don't have a lid. But I, I do like these because you can lock down the lid from plastic. Sorry about the plastic, but I don't. They, they're stackable, they work. And I have a couple of these on my deck. Just as a side note, when I'm collecting seed, and you have all these species, and then you have all these orders coming in, I have 14 orders this year, you never clean out your seed. You have seed left over. It just not, doesn't even seem possible. And this year I went right down to the, to the nibbins because I had some plantings come in at the tail end and they were great and they, they took my seed. So that, then I don't have to store it over winter or worry about the viability. Another thing I want to add is uh, Scott Weber is a noted, um, he, he's worked, Scott was with the DNR, wasn't he? Scott Weber, and he's an orchid guy and whatever, little blue stump farms. And I was asking him at a conference viability of seed, and I was all worried after the first year that the seed viability would dip. And he said no, he did some stuff on his own, so his own data points. He actually saw it go up in viability and then start coming down. That's a generalization. All the seeds are different, but these people are from Holy Wisdom. That was one of my bigger plantings. And a lot of that seed had sat for a year. And Wayne at Dane County had given new seed. And that sat for a year, so it was sitting, sitting around. And that prairie is better than any that I can think of. And what I think happened is that seeds have a seed coating. And it's got to break down for it to break dormancy. And I think by having them in storage, it broke down. I wouldn't store it for five years. But I don't think it hurts at least to it for a year, maybe push the two. It's anecdotal on my end. It's not scientific. Thank you. Karen, you've got good seeds. You've got new seeds this year. There they are, right there. Oh, there you are. <laughs> this is the new head of uh, Dane County Parks Natural Areas. She used to be with DeForest, Jolene. Yeah. So I just, I don't have a question, Rob, but I just wanted to say that, you know, just for everyone in here to realize that that's a quarter of a million dollars worth of seeds that all those organizations would have had to spend money to buy. Every year you're doing 